Um, yeah, I'm very happy this afternoon to be able to talk to you all about our efforts at imaging the circumnuclear dust in Cercinus. Um, of course, this was not done alone with the help of the entire Matisse team and numerous other people. And I mark in bold here all the people who are also taking part in this conference so that you can uh, check out what they're doing. Um, luckily, <laughs> I'm going third, so I get to skip over this for the most part. Christina and Violetta gave great introductions to why we want to study AGM with Matisse. So I'll immediately turn my focus to Circinus, which is the closest Seifert to. Um, Circinus was studied extensively with MIDI. Um, at first, it was revealed that the dust should be clumpy because of um, correlated flux variations on small baseline changes. Um, but then a later, more detailed follow-up actually produced models. I don't know if you can see my mouse properly, but um, there's this disk. Yes. Um, which is roughly aligned with the Maser emission, but then perpendicular to this, we have this large scale several parsec polar dust. And this was, you know, kind of at the dawn of this uh, revolution in thinking about what the, the torus should look like. Um, you know, as we move forward in time, mid infrared SEDs were added to the analysis and work by Marco Stolewski and co authors um, used the mid infrared SEDs plus the MIDI interferometric data to come up with a hyperbolic plus disk model. That's what I show here on the bottom. So we have a thin, clumpy disk, and perpendicular to it, we have a clumpy hyperboloid, uh, which is representing the, out the outflow cone. This is not dissimilar from other things that were mentioned earlier, such as the CAT 3D wind or um, SCIRTOR models. And then on slightly larger scales, even than what we're seeing with, with MIDI, um, Alma shows that there are spirals, inflows, outflows, and in general, just a very active environment, um, I mean, at the, the, you know, the few parsec scale. But the reason I'm talking to you today is because now with Matisse, we have 100, 150 correlated flux. And because Matisse is a four telescope interferometer, 100 closure phase spectra in the L, M, and N bands. Um, and using these correlated flux, but especially the closure phase data, which carry more information about the spatial distribution of the image, uh, we can attempt image reconstruction. Um, so we've split our data. Uh, focusing on the end band, I should mention, uh, into seven wavelength bins, which are chosen to be both in the continuum of the end band, but also inside of the 10 micron silicate absorption feature. Um, we also include AT baselines from MIDI, which represent and which capture rather the large scale dust structure. We unfortunately don't have the equivalent Matisse measurements uh, obtained yet. Um, but using in each of these independent wavelengths, uh, bins, we've done an urbis parameter grid search, which means changing things like the image field of view, the regularization function, the pixel scale, and so on. Um, this was followed up then uh, with looking at the L curves. It tells us, you know, how much regularization we need to apply. But then finally, we did delete the jackknifing. So basically, we picked at random 10% of our UV points and just threw them out and then redid the imaging. Uh, repeat this a thousand times, you get uh, an error estimate, first of all, of um, I mean, in the image plane. And also we took the median to get our, our final set of images. Um, without further ado, I guess I can show our images. On the, on the top here, I have all of the continuum images. So from 8.5 to roughly 13 micron. Um, I will now add the images made within the silicate absorption feature, which are, you know, there's lower flux there and it's a lower signal to noise, but the morphology is quite similar to everything else. Then also we have a Vizier sparse aperture mask uh, image reconstruction at 11.3 micron. And it actually helps give you know, context for, for where all of these Matisse images are taking place. But we can ask, you know, what, what exactly are we seeing here? And uh, the first thing that pops out is the, the polar emission, right? And all of the wavelength channels, we have quite extended polar emission at a very similar direction to what was seen with MIDI. Um, in addition to this, we have an unresolved point source at every wavelength. We have a, a disk component, which is especially prominent at the longer wavelengths, but it's still present at the shorter ones, just maybe a little fainter. And um, additionally, we have patchiness in the dust in the polar emission. And this is actually significant, several sigma significant patchiness, um, which is going to be quite interesting to look at moving forward. Um, but for most of the talk, we'll focus on the east and west flux enhancements, which are also um, surprising results from within the polar emission. And while we could look at probably each of these images for the duration of an entire talk, um, I'm going to take a flux-weighted mean of all of the continuum images to represent an N-band 
result. And this is something that we can kind of use as a, as a shorthand moving forward. I've overlaid here the Tristram et al. 2014 MIDI fit. Um, so this is the full width half maximum of the Gaussians. And you just see immediately how well the orientation and the um, extension of the polar dust matches up. Um, we see that the orientation of the disk is a little different, but both results have a thin disk that's you know, unresolved in the, in the width component. So this is still consistent with MIDI. And I mean, kind of as Christina already hinted at, we're moving away from the idea of a, of a smooth, simple geometric torus. And more or less directly here, we're seeing that this is very much uh, something that needs to be done because we're dominated by bipolar emission. It's, uh, it's patchy, it's not smooth, and uh, there's a lot of complexity going on. But in addition to looking at the uh, simply the morphology of the dust, we want to measure the temperature, similar to what Violetta had done. So we picked 13 apertures, more or less um, arbitrarily to capture all of the, the key features in the image. And we've uh, extracted the, the SEDs and fit a single black body with a standard ISM dust profile. Um, so I show some examples SEDs here. Let's just get an idea of the types of spectra we're fitting. And kind of in contrast to previous results and also in contrast to NGC 1068, we at least find no evidence of the uh, absorption changing across the field. Um, and this is surprising because both MIDI and uh, single dish observations showed a very strong absorption gradient across Circinus, and we're still exploring why we might not be capturing that with the Matisse data. Nonetheless, we can take our fitted SEDs and show uh, the fitted temperatures in this map. We find that there's uh, the peak temperature in the center corresponding with our point source. We have a very fast fall off along the disk. Um, and in fact, the lowest temperatures that we fit are, are in the disk, very you know, close to the central he um, heating source. And this is somewhat unexpected because you would expect it to happen several parsec away uh, in the polar dust. But instead, we actually find very warm dust far from the center in the polar direction. Um, moreover, these flux enhancements I mentioned earlier, the east-west ones, they're also temperature enhancements. Um, so one, we can ask why, first of all. And uh, Marco Stolevsky and others have postulated that there is maybe uh, an accretion disk in Cercinus which is tilted uh, with respect to the larger scale structures. Um, and what this actually means is it's more or less aligned with the green part of the Maser emission here. And um, then perpendicular to this is more directly illuminated. So I draw these arrows and you know, our, our astrometry is more or less relative, but it lines up really well. Um, yeah, it's probably, I mean, it could be a coincidence, um, but it's nonetheless very interesting. And I would be curious looking for moving forward uh, about what the dynamical lifetime of such a structure is in radiation hydro modeling. Uh, we can also ask how we get 250 Kelvin dust so far from the core. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time in this talk to go into um, all of our radio transfer comparisons, but we found the best agreement with um, clumpy torus models in terms of the overall temperature distribution. Finally, we can ask, is the material in the disk denser? Right? Why do we have this steep temperature gradient in the disk? Um, and I mean, the thought is that it's denser. And if it's dense, is it dense enough to play the role of the classical torus? Um, but unfortunately, we can't really answer that without digging into the LM observations, which are at a smaller scale and probe the hotter dust. Um, I got the sign from Leo that I should wrap up. Uh, so here's my summary slide. Um, our imaging has revealed new details in the active galactic nucleus of Cercinus. Um, we found these new east-west blobs or flux enhancements in the polar emission. Um, and we also find a disk which could be playing the role of the classical torus. Um, our temperature distribution, moreover, uh, implies clumpiness, especially through the comparisons to radio transfer modeling. Um, and we find relatively hot dust in the polar direction, which is overall uh, consistent with the idea of clumpiness. Uh, also, the patchiness that we observe could be direct evidence of, of clumps. While we're not probably resolving them directly, the, uh, it's likely related. And uh, this as paper was recently submitted. Looking forward to the list of things I have in future work on the bottom, but I'm happy to answer any questions for now. Okay, wonderful, Jacob. Thanks a lot for another fantastic talk. Amazing results. So we have a question here from Robert. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Leo. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Uh, Jacob, wonderful results. Really, really appreciate this, uh, this talk. I have a question. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you said that you don't see a gradient of variation in the silicate strength uh, across the structure. Whereas, if I recall correctly, uh, Tristan Metal 2014 did claim that there was a gradient uh, along the polar cone. Uh, so, uh, what's the difference? Um, how, how come the result is, is, uh, is so different? Yeah, no, this, this is a great question that we're still exploring, more or less, because um, what we think is going on is uh, that the Matisse observations are mostly done with, are only done with the UTs so far. So they're probing, let's say, smaller scales compared to the, um, the MIDI modeling, which included a lot of AT baselines. And uh, this difference, I mean, just spatially, we might be too far in to view the, this gradient. Um, but it also could be just a difference in approach of closure phases versus differential phases, and um, we would like to explore this further. Great, thank you. Okay, we're a bit behind time, but Walter, please, uh, a short question, please. Uh, if you assume that these hyperbolic cones, the outflows are dominant features in AGNs, and they're absorbing most of the ultraviolet, the largest, much more of the ultraviolet than the equatorial plane is, does this have an effect on the type one, type two paradigm? Because if there are clouds along a large fraction of the polar axis, then there should be only a very small number of type one galaxies. And has anyone looked at that geometry? I mean, if you have a very, very thin cone, where all the all the clouds are okay it doesn't obscure a large solid angle but then it also doesn't absorb a lot of ultraviolet and they wouldn't be very bright so has anyone looked into to making these two points of view co uh, work together yeah no that's a great question and i think and that there's nothing i'm aware of which has been done to fully explore the implications of the this geometry um but I think part of the idea of the hyperbolic cone was that it opens up enough to allow for a significant number of, of secret ones. Um, because otherwise, you're, you're exactly right that you're kind of getting uh, too much stuff near the base of the cone along the disk, and you would expect a, a lower number. Um, but I think larger simulations or you know projections for actual numbers based on this geometry have not been done yet, to my knowledge. But someone, please correct me if, 